Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the second webinar in the Illinois Budget Policy Toolbox, and today's discussion is titled, Tools to Address Revenue. My name is Amy Ingalls. I am a University of Illinois Extension Community and Economic Development Educator, and I'll moderate today's session. The University of Illinois Extension and Community, uh, Community and Economic Development team, we are pleased to partner with the University of Illinois Institute for Government and Policy Affairs to bring you the best academic scholarship on issues impacting what local officials grapple with um, at all different levels. So we have four speakers today, and at the conclusion of their presentations, we will have some time for questions. I will introduce um, Dr. Mooney. He is going to uh, introduce the rest of our speakers throughout the presentation today. Um, Dr. Christopher Mooney is the director of the University of Illinois Institute for Government and Public Affairs, and he holds a PhD in political science with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Mooney is the founding editor of the top academic journal in his field and he has taught at West Virginia University as well as the University of Essex in the UK. So with that, we we'll turn it over to Dr. Mooney. And I really thank you for being here, Dr. Mooney, with us as well as um, some of the rest of your um, uh, colleagues. Well, well, thanks a lot, Amy, and uh, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with your uh, colleagues out in the uh, web verse here today. Um, I'm going to turn on my video. You see what I look like and you see the uh, Abraham Lincoln's picture beside me, I see, so you'll know where I'm coming from. Um, okay, um, the uh, IGPA, or the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, is U of I's public policy think tank uh, with a focus on the state uh, of Illinois. In a sense, we bring uh, or at least our mission is to bring the resources of the University of Illinois to bear on the public problems of the state. Uh, and in that, uh, with that in mind, we have a long history of work on public finance in the state. We're uh, looking at the state economy, uh, public pensions, budgets and spending, et cetera. Uh, and in particular, in recent, uh, least recent few years, the, uh, we have a, a sub a project within the IGPA called the Fiscal Futures Project. And this is run by uh, David Merriman, who's going to join us today in a few minutes, and Richard Dye. Uh, and uh, they've brought, us, brought to our attention in the last few years the extremely serious nature of the fiscal problems of the state. Uh, in, in essence, the state has a, uh, a structural budget deficit that's growing worse every day. Uh, and this uh, graph is uh, from uh, some work by uh, Merriman and Dye at the IGPA and shows that the um, uh, expected budget deficit just gets larger and larger as time goes on. What's, what you're looking at here is the, um, the sort of budget deficit and negative numbers. Uh, if, it was, if we had a, a flat budget, it would be uh, zero, it would all be across the top at zero, but the, the thick uh, blue line uh, indicates uh, the projections for the budget deficit, annual budget deficit, um, if, um, uh, if the tax increase is not kept in and the pension uh, law that uh, is in the courts now is not uh, upheld, the, the dotted blue line just above that indicates the projections uh, if the pension law is upheld and allowed to be implemented. And then the green dotted line at the top is uh, the projections if the uh, pension law is implemented and if the uh, temporary tax increase would be uh, kept in place after January 2015. And you can see even under that scenario, uh, the, the state has continuing budget deficits in, in the range of one to, to two million dollars and, and, and increasing especially after 2021. So uh, things are not good. And the recent legislative session did nothing to change this. Uh, except to perhaps make it worse by using one-time money to fund the second half of the fiscal year when revenues are going to drop off precipitously uh, under the under current law. So what we've done with the toolbox is to uh, uh, write these uh, various commentaries on some background issues, uh, which we talked about in the May 
uh, webinar, uh, revenue options, which we'll talk about today, and then spending options, which we'll talk about in the August uh, webinar. Uh, these are written for the sort of smart newspaper reader, uh, not for economists or political scientists. It's what we think that the informed voter ought to know uh, pros, cons, impacts, et cetera, about these issues. And like I say, last month uh, in the webinar, we uh, looked at uh, the uh, bleak fiscal picture facing the state, and you can find that uh, webinar in the archives. Today, we're going to talk about a few of the potential revenue options that are on the table, and uh, uh, only a few is we're limited in time. There's more in the toolbox itself if you'd like to look at them. Okay, so the first uh, our first speaker today is going to be Julian Wright. He is uh, a faculty member with IGPA. He's in the Department of Finance at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. He is an economist uh, with a recent degree from the University of Chicago, and he is going to talk about uh, sin taxes, something we all love to talk about. Julian? Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so, uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, one possible tool that the state could use uh, to increase its revenue, uh, and that's to increase its level of, of sin taxes. So, I'd like to start out by first defining or describing what I mean uh, by sin taxes. So at a very general level, uh, sin taxes refer to any taxes uh, on goods that society perceives uh, as undesirable. Uh, so uh, typical examples include things like uh, taxes on cigarettes, uh, taxes on alcohol, uh, or, or gambling. Um, and indeed, these, these are the goods that I consider in my analysis. Um, but we could also um, apply the, uh, the idea to tax on other goods, uh, like, for example, tax on soda, uh, which is something that the state considered uh, earlier this year. Uh, so a, a key feature uh, of these taxes is that they are typically perceived as voluntary uh, in the sense that you only pay the tax uh, if you consume the good. So uh, unlike, for example, an income tax or a sales tax, uh, which are generally inescapable, uh, it's easy to avoid paying a cigarette tax by simply uh, not purchasing cigarettes. So uh, there are a few advantages uh, that accompany uh, uh, sin taxes. So uh, one is that uh, they can increase uh, efficiency uh, by mitigating the effects of negative externalities. So if we consider secondhand smoke, for example, um, uh, a smoker who consumes cigarettes emits secondhand smoke, uh, which can harm the health of others uh, around him, or at least be unpleasant uh, to others around him. Um, so that that's something that we would call a, a negative externality. Uh, or if we consider alcohol, if we think of a, a drunk driver, when they get into an accident, they harm not only themselves, uh, but also anybody else who was involved in the accident. Uh, so in these cases, an, an increase in the level of sin taxes uh, can, can mitigate uh, these externalities at least somewhat by forcing the consumer to internalize to some extent uh, uh, the negative consequences that their consumption imposes on the others, on others around them. Uh, another advantage uh, of sin taxes is that they can improve uh, public health. Uh, so for, again, returning to the example of, of cigarettes, if we increase the tax on cigarettes, uh, this can cause a decrease in the level of smoking, and this in turn can help save money for the state by reducing the amount of money it needs to spend on Medicaid expenditures uh, that are attributable to smoking-related illnesses uh, like lung cancer or emphysema, uh, et cetera. So, and finally, I'd, I'd like to note that uh, another advantage of these taxes is that they tend to be uh, more politically palatable uh, than other revenue alternatives. Uh, and this, this relates to some of their features that I've already noted. Um, certainly, uh, if you're, for example, a non-smoker, uh, a cigarette tax is not going to uh, bother you too much because it's, you're not, it's not something you're going to have to pay, right? So uh, in these senses, it's a smaller set of people that are paying these taxes, also because they come with some of these other perceived advantages, such as improvements in public health, uh, a lot of people find that uh, these taxes uh, come with benefits that other tax increases uh, don't come with. So for, for these reasons and, and a few others, 
politicians often find it easier to raise these sorts of taxes uh, than other sorts of taxes. Uh, that said, there's also certainly a, a few disadvantages uh, of these taxes as well. Uh, so one is that uh, they're less uh, economically efficient uh, than a broad-based tax, uh, like a sales tax. So a sales tax uh, is broad in the sense that it taxes uh, all goods equally and it doesn't favor uh, one good uh, over another. So the sin tax is almost the opposite of this. Uh, it's a very narrow tax that targets just a few goods and leaves other goods untouched. So a lot of economists uh, don't like this because it introduces an inefficiency because it causes consumers uh, to favor certain types of consumption uh, over other types of consumption as a result of the tax. Uh, a second disadvantage associated with these taxes is that they tend to be paid for disproportionately uh, by the poor. So it, it's well known that the poor spend a much larger fraction of their income uh, on, uh, on goods like cigarettes, alcohol, and gambling uh, than wealthier individuals do. So as a result, if you raise the taxes on these goods, uh, the poor will shoulder a disproportionate burden uh, of the tax uh, relative to, uh, to higher income individuals. And then finally, another issue is that uh, one must be cautious uh, with these taxes in that if you raise them too high, you may encourage consumers uh, to flee the state and to purchase these goods uh, in neighboring states that have uh, lower taxes. Uh, so it's been uh, noted in, uh, in some good work by David Merriman, for example, that the, the existing already fairly large tax differentials on cigarettes uh, between Chicago and neighboring jurisdictions uh, appears to cause uh, individuals to go purchase cigarettes uh, in, in another, in another jur jurisdiction in order to avoid uh, the high taxes in Chicago. So that's something that we always have to be uh, aware of when we increase these taxes. So one of the things that uh, I consider in my analysis uh, is to try to answer the question, how much revenue could the state of Illinois raise uh, by increasing uh, the, the levels of its sin taxes? So in order to answer that question, I consider three hypothetical tax increases, a tax increase on cigarettes, uh, a tax increase on alcohol, uh, and a tax increase on uh, casino gambling. And I uh, do something very simple. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, for simplicity, assume uh, that these tax increases uh, do not increase cross-border shopping. Uh, that is, I'm going to assume that they don't cause individuals to, to purchase these goods uh, in the neighboring states at, at a rate higher than they already do. So uh, by making that assumption, I'm going to be essentially estimating an upper bound or what is the maximal amount of revenue that the state could raise uh, uh, by increasing these taxes. So the table of this slide shows the, the hypothetical tax increases that I consider in my analysis. So uh, the, the last column there shows what the tax increase, uh, the hypothetical tax increase is. So for cigarettes, I'm considering an increase uh, in the tax rate of uh, 50 cents uh, per pack. Uh, for alcohol, I'm considering increases of 15 cents, 30 cents, and $3 per gallon respectively for beer, wine, and spirits. To put those numbers in, in context, uh, these tax increases correspond to about 1.4 cents per beer, 1.2 cents per glass of wine, and about 3.5 cents per drink uh, per spirits. And then finally, uh, I also consider an increase in income tax for casino gaming uh, of, of 5%. Uh, so overall, you can see this is a pretty a modest tax increase. Uh, these are not uh, massive increases uh, as compared to some of the historical increases. That, uh, the state of Illinois has levied, um, but they're also not trivial increases either. Um, uh, if look, looking now at the, at the next table, uh, this shows how much revenue I estimate the state could raise uh, from each of these individual tax increases. So if we look at the, the first row in the last column, I estimate that the 50 cent uh, the tax increase on a pack of cigarettes would increase the state's annual revenue uh, by approximately $175 million per year. And if we total these numbers down across all the rows, uh, I estimate that uh, uh, altogether these tax increases uh, would increase the annual state revenue uh, by approximately $330 million per year. Um, 
So the last thing I want to do is sort of try to put these numbers in context and uh, try to think about what the, the takeaway is here. Um, so it's certainly true that an increase in the sin taxes for the state uh, could raise revenue. Um, uh, with the cautionary note that this may have efficiency and distributional costs, in particular the majority or most of, if not the majority of the revenue would be raised uh, from lower income individuals. Um, putting those issues aside, uh, under these uh, sort of rosy assumptions, modest increases in these taxes could generate about $300 million, maybe a little bit more uh, in annual revenue for the state. But to put that number in context, IGPA and other work uh, has estimated that the state's annual budget shortfall uh, it will reach approximately $14 billion per year uh, by 2025. Right? So that means that the, uh, the sin taxes, even under these rosy uh, estimates, uh, would only fill about 3% uh, of this gap. So uh, what this means is that although sin taxes could, can possibly be part of the solution to the state's budget woes, uh, the bulk of any additional revenue collection is going to need to come from other sources. Uh, that, uh, that concludes my uh, discussion, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the next person now. Great. Thanks a lot, Julian. Uh, next we, up, we have uh, Dave Merriman, who is a faculty member on IGPA in the Department of Public Administration at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is an economist. Uh, he is also a co-director of the Fiscal Futures Project, which is a driving force behind uh, the uh, Illinois Budget Policy Toolbox. Uh, and Dave's going to talk about uh, business taxes. Thanks. So yes, uh, as Chris said, um, I'm going to talk about business taxes and um, uh, as a potential tool. And this has, of course, been talked about as a way of dealing with some of the fiscal problems of uh, the state of Illinois. And uh, first I want to uh, follow Julian's lead a bit and, and give some background on business taxes. What is a business tax and who pays it? And actually, uh, economists, the, the whole notion of a business tax is, is something I think that needs a little bit of clarification. Uh, we tend to think of businesses as remitting taxes, that is they write checks, but they don't necessarily bear the burden of the taxes. So the, the, the taxes that uh, businesses actually pay um, have to fall necessarily on someone else since a, a business is a, simply an institution. And they have to fall either on the owners of the firms, uh, the customers, or the suppliers, or at least those are the three most likely places that business taxes uh, could fall. And um, because of that, uh, there's very little professional consensus about how businesses should be taxed as a general thing because it depends a lot on uh, which of these three groups you think bear the ultimate burden of these taxes. Which of these, uh, so for instance, uh, owners of the business might bear the burden if the profits of the firm fell. Customers might bear the burden if prices uh, went up. Suppliers might bear the burden, uh, including employees, for example, if wages, uh, fell when business taxes increased or employment uh, decreased, perhaps. So uh, what are the criteria for business taxes? These are the general criteria we have, really, for all taxes in looking at uh, this. Uh, economic efficiency uh, of the taxes. To what extent did they make the economy work better? And uh, there's some reason to believe that user fees equal to the cost of services that are consumed by businesses uh, might encourage business expansion to the point where, to the, to the optimal point, to the point where the cost incurs are equal to the benefits produced. So that one criteria is looking at how these taxes affect economic efficiency. The second criteria is vertical equity. Uh, you know, which who bears the burden? Is it the people that are most able to join the burden, maybe the, the relatively wealthy? Is it poorer individuals, as Julian talked about with sin tax? Uh, that, that's uh, an important uh, issue in uh, tax design. But with business taxes, where it's often unclear who bears the burden of the tax, uh, the, the issue of vertical equity tends to get cloudy. And it's not clear that raising business taxes 
It's not clear how that affects the distribution of burdens across, for example, income classes. A third really important issue with respect to business taxes is administrative efficiency. Um, businesses have a great capacity actually to collect revenue for business taxes and to remit that revenue. For, so for example, the sales tax, which we often think of as a tax on consumers, makes great use of businesses because they are in a good position, in particular retailers, are in a good position to collect revenues and to remit it to the government. And so one important reason for having business taxes is simply because they are an efficient way of gathering up the money. Another issue to think about with respect to business taxes is the stability of revenue. Uh, we want a system of revenue where we can count, we can predict how much revenue we'll get and we can count on it from year to year. And uh, as I'll talk about a little bit more, revenues, particularly from some business taxes, can be quite volatile. And so that's one of the reasons we might not want to be heavily reliant on business taxes, certain types of business taxes at least. Well, okay, let's see in local taxes the businesses currently pay. And, and this is where I think there's a real difference in the views of uh, people who are well informed about this topic and kind of the general public and to some extent even legislators. The biggest tax that businesses remit by far, state and local tax, is the property tax. This accounts uh, for in Illinois, here you see uh, figures from a study done by a, uh, the consulting firm uh, uh, for a consulting firm, the consulting firm Ernst and Young for Council on State Taxation, and it shows figures from Illinois and for the nation as a whole. In Illinois, nearly 40% of the business taxes paid are from the property tax. After that, the sales tax contributes 14%. Uh, other kinds of excise taxes uh, contribute about 16%. The corporate income tax, which gets uh, probably most of the attention, contributes only 11% of the revenue that that businesses pay. So when we think about business taxes, we should really think particularly about property taxes and then to a lesser extent about sales and other kinds of business taxes. Okay, so certainly the discussion, Illinois has a, has a large uh, gap between projected spending and projected revenue and one discussion has been about uh, increasing uh, taxes on business. And within this, I'm going to talk about three potential options for business taxes that we may want to consider. So one issue that's discussed is the corporate income tax and uh, broadening the corporate income tax base by eliminating some tax deductions. Um, the, the, when we think about these kinds of tax deductions, things that might make the corporate income tax base include more of the income that corporations uh, receive or um, we can go to uh, something developed by the Illinois Comptroller called the tax, uh, a tax expenditure. Each year, the Illinois Comptroller publishes a list of tax expenditures and talks about how much revenue could be raised by eliminating them, each of them. The most important one is the net operating loss deduction, which allows the carryover of losses from previous years on current year's taxes. So if if you have a loss last year and this year you have a profit, you can take that loss that you had last year and average it into the income that you had this year and reduce your taxes. The possible revenue effect from this uh, is about $319 million per year. So to put this in perspective, this one change alone would raise about as much revenue as Julian told us uh, could be raised from the increasing sin taxes. Uh, we might get another 300 to 400 million dollars per year from uh, from other changes, which broaden the corporate income tax base. And I'll talk more about the benefits and costs, or the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of doing that in a bit. But I want to move on to two other options. An alternative option, much bigger, more dramatic option, would be to create a, an all-new tax, such as a gross receipts tax or a value-added tax. Uh, these are taxes that some other states have, New Hampshire, Ohio, Texas, Washington, have some kind of tax such as this. Most other highly developed countries, and most countries in the European Union, have a value-added tax or a VAT. Um, this kind of tax could be introduced in Illinois. Uh, there was a 2007 proposal under Governor Bogorovich for an Illinois gross receipts tax. It 
month of resounding political defeat, but it was estimated it could bring in $7 billion of revenue annual. So you're talking about an order of magnitude different compared to uh, relatively minor changes in the corporate uh, income tax. Obviously, we wouldn't have to have a value-added tax that brought in that much revenue. We could scale it down or we could use it to replace all or part of the corporate income tax. A third potential option is to create a statewide property surtax on business. So we currently have a property tax statewide. The Illinois Department of Revenue uh, aids in the administration of this. Some of the work, a lot of the work is done at the county level, but it's monitored at the state level. And it certainly would be possible to have a statewide property tax. Arkansas, Washington, Michigan, uh, and Minnesota already have statewide property taxes. The only one that has a special property tax on business is Michigan, and it's relatively small. So we would be doing something that was rather unusual in the nation, but certainly not unprecedented. How much revenue could we raise with this sort of tax? According to the Illinois Department of Revenue, there's about $100 billion of commercial and industrial property statewide. So a relatively modest tax of 1% on these properties would raise about a billion dollars. So we're talking about potentially a lot of revenue. Currently, businesses pay about $8 billion in property taxes. So this would be, um, you know, a reasonable uh, increase in the tax. Um, I should say that this would hit not only corporations, but all businesses um, uh, with this tax. So I, I'm running out of time. Um, I want to talk uh, a little, just very broadly, uh, very quickly, about uh, its effect of these on other objectives. Um, if we were broad in the income tax base, we might change the way corporations react to that by reporting differences, essentially evasion, or there might be a change in business practices. practices. The relatively modest changes I've talked about here would have probably small changes in business practices. Creating a new tax, as I said, would treat all businesses, whether they're corporate or non-corporate, uniformly, uh, and would also tax businesses regardless of whether it was profitable, and it's controversial whether that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, very difficult to say very much about the distributional effects of the policy options that I've talked about because we would have to know a lot more about uh, and do a lot more study of exactly how these taxes would interact with the competitiveness in various markets. It's very unclear what the distributional effects would be. Uh, so that's about all I have time to talk about today. There's, there's many more issues we could discuss, and here's some of the additional reading uh, I've listed here. And then, of course, you can always come to IGPA and uh, send us emails or give us a call if you want to talk in more detail about these questions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dave. Uh, our next speaker is uh, J. Fred Gertz. Uh, Fred is a professor emeritus uh, at the University of uh, Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign in the Department of Economics and IGPA. Uh, he uh, has is a longtime observer of the uh, Illinois con economy in particular, and you'll, you may be familiar with his uh, monthly flash index uh, that basically keeps a uh, keeps the pulse of the uh, uh, Illinois economy. So Fred and, and uh, Fred is going to talk a little bit about sales tax options today. Okay. Uh, this is Fred Gerson. It's good to be here again. Uh, we had a good discussion a few weeks ago on uh, similar kind of topics. Um, we have a, a project called the Toolbox uh, Project where we talk about um, a number of fiscal issues. And I wrote a paper, a short paper, on the sales tax. And that's what I'm going to discuss today. Uh, there are two issues about the sales, or two ways of thinking about this. Uh, we could ask the question, can we make the sales tax better and collect the same amount of revenue we are now? Or uh, could we use the sales tax to increase the amount of revenue? So uh, I'll discuss both of those. But generally, the, the focus now is on how do we get additional revenue. Obviously, the state of Illinois is in need of extra revenue, so uh, the, the, the interest is probably more in additional revenue uh, produ production, not uh, just making the tax uh, uh, better on its uh, with the same amount of revenue. But just to review uh, the situation in Illinois, Illinois, like uh, 45 or 46 other states, has a tax on 
uh, what, is, what is called retail sales, we'll see actually it's not exactly retail sales. And the state uh, rate is 6.25%. 5% .25%, uh, of that is kept by the state, and 1.25% is a return to uh, local governments in various ways. Uh, that rate, the 6.25 rate, is not a, a particularly high rate compared to other states, but uh, as you well know, especially uh, know well if you live in Cook County or uh, Chicago or even Champaign, there are a number of uh, local add-on taxes that uh, increase the rate well above the 6.25 percent, close to 10 uh, percent in, in uh, some places. So the uh, situation we're in is that if, if you wanted to have more revenue, uh, simply increasing the tax rates uh, has some uh, real problems because uh, people are going to compare it to surrounding areas that may uh, force uh, some purchases outside the, the state of Illinois, things of that sort. So the, a higher rate is not is certainly not uh, forbidden, but it's probably not a, a very uh, productive kind of option. So the question is, are there ways of, uh, of uh, generating more revenue uh, but without raising the rate? And the obvious uh, answer uh, that, that people have talked about already is uh, find a way to broaden the base, include a, a broader base, which has both uh, revenue implications and also uh, implications in terms of both efficiency and uh, fairness or equity. So again, we're talking about the second biggest uh, source of tax revenue in the state, uh, it, it, well below the uh, state income tax, especially with the higher income tax right now, but it's still a very, uh, very productive tax. So what I'm going to talk about next is uh, uh, what would an ideal sales tax look like? How does that uh, compare to the state of Illinois? Well, the sales tax is based upon an idea that uh, taxes should be levied on ability to pay. That is, you should get, make people pay for uh, government services, not based on the services they receive, but upon the, uh, uh, some measure of their economic capacity. Now, the various measures of economic capacity, income sale, uh, would be one, consumption another, and wealth still another. So this is one particular way of implementing an, an ability to pay tax, which is based upon uh, consumption. That is what people use up, not what they, what they produce. So it is an ability to pay tax. Uh, in uh, an ideal situation, it would be a very broad base. It would include all, all sorts of consumption activities, uh, not a narrow base. So uh, a broad-based tax uh, that would tax all sources of consumption would be have a base that would uh, come close to the uh, income tax base. But in Illinois, we fall uh, far short of that. So let me talk about a couple uh, areas of exclusion where, where we uh, do not include things that probably would be part of an ideal base and then talk about some things that are included probably incorrectly. So the, the two uh, major uh, exclusions, uh, uh, at least the obvious exclusions from the Illinois tax base is, first of all, uh, most services are not taxed, and uh, in particular consumer services. So uh, in, in uh, the mind of a, a tax expert or an economist, it doesn't make a lot of difference whether someone buys an exercise machine or they buy a membership in a gym. Uh, you're still paying for uh, a particular kind of outcome, or whether you take your clothes to the dry cleaner or, or, or wash it at home and buy a wash machine and soap and so on. Uh, so so from, from the standpoint of uh, both fairness and the standpoint of uh, not, not changing the incentives here, there's no particular reason to tax one kind of activity, which is the purchase of, uh, of what, what's uh, called tangible personal property, uh, automobiles or, th uh, or uh, uh, records or uh, uh, appliances or things of that sort, and not tax other things which provide the similar kind of, similar kind of benefits. So excluding uh, uh, services uh, cuts down the, the base. It also cuts down the uh, uh, growth of the uh, of the tax base because services are becoming a more important part of our economy. And uh, by not not taxing them, we lose a lot of uh, uh, potential revenue in the future. The other thing, which is uh, somewhat harder to uh, not hard to explain, but maybe uh, takes more convincing is that Illinois also exempts uh, food at the state level, not necessarily at the local level. And the argument there is that uh, since uh, lower income uh, people consume a disproportionate uh, share of their income on food compared to higher income people, eliminating the uh, food from the tax base makes the tax less regressive. That's true to a certain extent, but it comes at a very big price. Uh, so when you exclude uh, food from the base, you're excluding uh, you know, rice and beans for uh, low-income people. You're also excluding lobster and filet mignon for higher-income people. So there's a huge amount of tax revenue that is lost 
that uh, provides relief to a relatively small number of people. And secondly, uh, those people who are receiving food stamps and use food stamps don't pay a sales tax on that. So to the extent that low-income people are relying upon food stamps for uh, uh, purchases of food, uh, the, they're not paying tax to begin with. So including, uh, the, uh, including both uh, uh, food and services would substantially uh, increase the base. Now, there are a number of other things that could be included, but really no one is talking about that. For example, um, uh, medical services, educational services could also be included, but uh, that's not really on most people's menu. In addition to that, uh, in addition to uh, exempting things that probably should be part of the base, we also include a number of things that uh, should not be part of the base, in particular business-to-business -business purchases. The idea of a sales tax is to tax things once at the uh, at the final stage of, uh, of the, uh, transmitted from the retailer to the consumer, not taxed it multiple times through the production process. So by taxing business-to-business -business purchases, we're uh, taxing uh, the same activity more than once in kind of a capricious way. The more a good turns over, the more likely it would be that you'll have uh, extra taxes there. Now, no one right now is talking about uh, getting rid of uh, the taxation of a lot of business-to-business -business, uh, uh, transactions, but over, you know, if we really wanted to fully uh, reform the system, we probably should look at that as well. So what are the, uh, what are the suggestions here? Uh, well, again, the idea, I could do it, say, uh, one of two ways. Uh, one, we could lower the tax rate and broaden the base and make the tax fairer and get the same amount of revenue, or we could keep the tax rate the same and broaden the base and get more revenue. So you can think of either of those outcomes. And the second one is probably more, more important than the first right now. So the first thing would be the taxation uh, of, of consumer services. So include uh, the things that uh, we're familiar with, dry cleaning, health care, uh, admissions to movies and things of that sort, uh, and the tax base, just like we tax uh, uh, washing machines and we tax the exercise machines and we tax uh, TVs that you bring home to watch entertainment. Uh, a second thing would be, uh, and this again is uh, maybe uh, a little bit more surprising, eliminate the, uh, the, the state exemption for food because uh, there's a huge revenue loss with probably little equity gain there. And uh, what should be done, though, along with that, is to have some kind of, uh, of mechanism, maybe through the income tax or through a refundable credit or something of that sort, to uh, compensate low-income people. So having paid the tax, to find a way to remove the tax burden uh, someplace else. Uh, consider, but probably not act right now, on uh, removing the business-to-business uh, -business, uh, transactions from the tax base. That would be a huge revenue loss, even though it would increase the, uh, the, the uh, equity and, and efficiency of the tax, but it's probably, this is probably not the time to do that. And the, uh, uh, the, the last thing uh, the, uh, that's on the screen here, I'll talk about one other thing that's also important. Uh, uh, avoid uh, gimmicks, uh, I, I would call the elimination of food kind of a gimmick, but uh, tax holidays and things of that sort, amnesties, uh, typically produce revenue in the short run, but they're damaging in the long run in a kind of an arbitrary, capricious sort of way of doing things. Uh, one thing I didn't add here uh, that is important is we also have to find a way, or, or, or at least continue to find a way to try to tax purchases over the Internet. Uh, there, there's no, no particular reason why uh, people who buy something over the Internet from a remote vendor shouldn't pay the same tax that uh, someone buys from a, who buys from a bricks and mortar. Uh, seller. And right now, the, uh, the Illinois tax does, in, in, in fact, require tax on, on uh, Internet purchases from remote vendors. Uh, as David mentioned, though, the problem is that uh, it's not easy to collect in many cases, so we ha have to find a way to increase the collection ease. And, and the easiest way in the way that may be happening in, in a slow motion kind of process is to have the federal government uh, enact legislation that would make vendors, regardless of where they are, uh, collect the tax. So, uh, so again, the sales tax, uh, uh, these reforms are not going to solve, just as in the previous case, not going to solve all our, our fiscal problems. They would have kind of a dual benefit of uh, making the tax more, uh, more even-handed and also uh, presumably uh, raise some more revenue as well. So I'll conclude with that, and then we can go to questions. Well, thank you very much, um, all the presenters. Um, you did a fantastic job you know, covering all kinds of different options um, that are available. Um, 
are possibly available, the reforms um, that, that you've analyzed um, also. So I did want to open it up to questions, and I do have a few um, that, are, that have been posted in the chat box, so let me go ahead and get to those immediately. And um, I'll start with um, the first one that was posted, and it says, and it goes to sin taxes, um, so it says, on sin taxes, what amount of loss might we expect through smuggling, et cetera? Um, so Dr. Rice, maybe you want to um, take a stab at that one. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is a good, a good question. Um, so smuggling is certainly a concern, and so smuggling here I'm going to consider as distinct from the cross-border shopping I mentioned in my discussion. So smoking, I have in mind somebody goes from another state, purchases a bunch of cigarettes, brings them back, and then sells them illegally uh, in the state. Um, so I think this is definitely a concern uh, for cigarettes because you don't generally consume them in the same place that you purchase them. People are okay buying them from an illegal vendor uh, on the street, for example. Uh, a lot of alcohol, on the other hand, gets purchased and consumed in, in, in bars and restaurants. So I think smuggling is less of a concern there because those places are more likely to obey the law. Uh, similar to gambling, it's, you know, a, a similar issue with gambling, it's hard to, to smuggle in a, a casino. Um, but with cigarettes, definitely, I think, you know, it, it can be a problem. People can work, uh, someone can go purchase cigarettes in, for example, Missouri, where the tax rate is only 17 cents, uh, and then resell them here illegally in Illinois. Um, so the key thing that matters is the tax differential uh, between states. If Illinois increases its state tax uh, on cigarettes, for example, and other states do not, this is going to worsen the smuggling problem. Uh, by contrast, if all the states increase their taxes together, uh, this, uh, this won't worsen uh, smuggling. So to your, to your question directly, I, I have not seen any studies uh, that directly estimate how smuggling responds to changes in, uh, in cigarette taxes. Um, I, I did read somewhere that there is, there is one study that estimated that about 50% of the cigarettes consumed in New York are smuggled. Um, this is a, an extraordinarily high uh, number. Uh, I'm not sure if it's correct, but that, that is a, one I've seen, a number I've seen bandied about. So New York has uh, uh, the highest uh, cigarette tax rates in the nation. Uh, their tax rate on cigarettes is about $4. Here in Illinois, it's about uh, $2. So, you know, sort of a back of the envelope guess is that if we increase the tax on cigarettes by about 50 cents, maybe this increase is smuggling here by about uh, five percentage points or so. Um, so that would, you know, lower my revenue estimates by, say, 5 or $10 million. Um, But uh, that's really just a, a back of the envelope guess because uh, I've not seen any good uh, direct estimates uh, of smuggling. Yeah. 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 An expert, David, uh, did some work about that as well. You might want to comment. So I, I, just, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, in, in Illinois, a very special consideration is that there are, um, there are state taxes on cigarettes. There are also uh, Cook County taxes and City of Chicago taxes. And those are very substantial. I think Cook County is now up to three dollars a pack. Um, and so the, the smuggling, there is smuggling that goes on that we know of from outside of Cook County into Cook County. There, there's some incentive to smuggle into Illinois from Indiana or Missouri, for example, but the very strong incentive to smuggle um, outside of Cook County into Cook County, even from the state. So when you think about revenue consequences, um, it gets a little more complicated when you bring that into account. And I've estimated that um, about 75% of the cigarettes smoked in the city of Chicago uh, have not paid city of Chicago taxes. And uh, uh, more than a half of those uh, have not paid Cook County taxes. But the state tax compliance is much, much higher. Okay, any other comments on that particular question? Um, okay, Jim had a question about how much would a sales tax on internet transactions bring in? Uh, well, it, it's really a complicated issue. I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't have a number, but it would be uh, uh, substantial, but not, not uh, kind of uh, a game changer right now. But the problem is, in the future, uh, internet sales are, are likely to uh, to grow. And it, uh, it's kind of an odd thing where it disadvantages uh, local people and, and helps uh, remote vendors. So it, it would probably be a matter of uh, right now of three or five percent of the sales tax revenue. But if uh, nothing happened and, and internet sales continue to grow, uh, it would become just like services are going to grow, internet sales are going to grow. It would be a, an increasing problem in the future and make the, the tax less responsive. Yeah. 
Um, again, the, the state of Illinois has, uh, just the past couple of years, put a line on the income tax form, which is a, called the use tax line. So when you file your income tax, you're supposed to pay the sales tax due if, if you bought something over the internet and you didn't pay sales tax on it. Um, only about 4% um, of income tax filers pay anything on that line. If we, the estimate has some figures on it, and I can't bring them up right now, but I think uh, Fed has got about the right order of magnitude. We're talking about a small percentage of sales tax revenue that the, the Department of Revenue thinks would be due if people actually complied with that. Okay, and Kathy, are there options that are considered business friendly? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, um, you know, my understanding uh, of the literature and also what I hear from business executives is that the most important thing in business taxes is predictability uh, rather than the level of the taxes actually. Businesses want, they don't like volatility. If they're going to locate in a region, they want to know, they want to be able to predict what their businesses are. So I think, um, you know, uh, certainly no one likes to pay taxes, but businesses can deal with it if, uh, I think, if they're, uh, there's a clear rationale for the taxes, and they're consistently applied. So I think one of the big problems with the corporation income tax is that it allows firms to change corporate form uh, into, into non-corporate forms, partnerships, for example, or limited uh, other kinds of, of, of forms, and it allows them to escape taxes because of that. That makes it harder for firms that have to be incorporated. So I think a, a kind of more broad-based tax that taxed all businesses kind of more uniformly would be more business friendly. But I think the most important thing the state legislators can do is figure out a long-term plan to fix the fiscal problem and to set the level of revenue at a reasonable, consistent rate. I, I don't know if the, my colleagues want to comment on that or have other things to add? Well, let me just say a word about the corporate tax. The corporate tax in Illinois uh, is uh, higher than many people believe because there's a 2.5% add-on that the state doesn't really count as corporate taxes, but businesses do because it goes for what's called personal property replacement purposes. So, and then you have to look at that within the context of, of the whole world and uh, the, the, the uh, the United States now has uh, the highest tax uh, rate in the world for corporate income. And it's not because we raised our tax rates, it's because everyone else has lowered them. So when you add the, the, the federal level plus the rate plus the state rate, it's a pretty substantial rate. So I don't think uh, you can look very much to, uh, towards the uh, corporate tax that is getting more revenue, but uh, maybe finding ways to make it more even handed, as David said, would be a, a way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, we got a couple more questions. Um, the next question is, uh, what about the motor fuel taxes? Are those a significant source of revenue, and is there an opportunity there? Well, the, the, the state man again. The motor fuel taxes are dedicated um, to transportation, and so um, the, the increasing that tax. Uh, probably would not alleviate the state's fiscal problems unless there was some attempt to use it for things other than, and I think they're actually dedicated to highways, uh, or at least primarily to highways. Um, I, I wouldn't alleviate the state's fiscal problems unless there was an attempt to, to uh, move some of that revenue out of that spending category, which I think there would be great political resistance to it. Motor fuel taxes, both in Illinois and in the country, um, are considered by experts as low, and this is this is partly because um, uh, car mileage has increased. So uh, the, the the gasoline uh, miles per gallon has increased a lot. So the revenue take from fuel taxes uh, has been insufficient to maintain the roads we already have. So um, I, I think motor fuel taxes. Um, we have to look at them as a source, just kind of fix the problem within 
at least given current political realities within the kind of transportation sector um, rather than uh, more generally for fixing the, the state's fiscal problems. And uh, going back to the question uh, before, if there is one tax that's considered business friendly, it probably would be the motor fuel tax because businesses really need the infrastructure to operate well, and the Chamber of Commerce and other business organizations actually would uh, agree to a, a, a tax a, a hike in the uh, motor fuel area. But again, as David said, it would go to uh, improve our roadways and infrastructure, not to uh, solve the general problem of uh, the state uh, budget. And for some reason, there has been huge resistance uh, about this, even though it seems to be the most logical way of going, both nationally and in the state. The, uh, the federal uh, motor fuel tax hasn't been increased uh, since the early 90s. I mean, we've had uh, much higher gasoline prices, which don't impact the revenues because it's based on a on a, a certain number of cents per gallon. And secondly, as David said, uh, economy, uh, fuel economy has gotten much better, so people don't have to buy as much gasoline to travel the same number of miles, even though they still need the roads. So I think that we really need the gasoline tax increase, but it wouldn't have anything to do directly with the, uh, the state fiscal problem. Okay, and our last question from Jim again is, besides the income tax, is there really any one solution to the $2 billion plus state structural deficit? I can start out and David can add to it. Uh, I, I think the income tax has to be a piece of the puzzle. Uh, it may not have to be the only piece. Unfortunately, uh, I, I guess in, in one sense, uh, Governor Quinn was uh, somewhat courageous in, in arguing for the, the, the uh, continuation of the uh, uh, so-called temporary income tax hike, not, not let it ratchet down as it's uh, supposed to do. But on the other hand, uh, as part of his talk, he had a kind of preemptory strike against uh, taxing services. So he started out by saying, I'm not going to tax services. I don't want to tax retirement income. So the two uh, most important sources of base broadening for the income tax and sales tax were ruled off the table by Governor Quinn to start off with. And so I, I really think we do need to have uh, some continuation uh, close to where we are now in terms of the income tax. And in particular, if you look at this budget session, we're going to have half of the income tax increase will continue, will continue to continue as written in law through um, the end of December. And even with half a year's uh, income from a higher rate, we're still falling far short of being expenditures. And next year is going to be even more severe because we'll have a whole year of loss next year. So I think something has to be done about the income tax. Not necessarily the exact um, continuation of where it is now, but something has to be done to deal with the revenue issue. Yeah, I, I would agree with Fred. Uh, it's, it's hard to see how we continue without a, a, a change in the in income tax, from at least from current law. Um, you know, I think when you say, is there any really a solution? Well, the, there's the political realities and then there's the fiscal realities. I think the, the you know, a experts could come up with a n any number of relatively efficient uh, fiscal ways to fix the problems. That given the political situation, I think um, we're very likely to stuck with the, the tax, the main tax system we have here. And that means we're probably talking about uh, tweaks to the income tax and maybe tweaks to the rate and probably only very small changes in the sales tax. And, and, and then probably uh, a long-term kind of spending austerity uh, to, to eventually balance the budget. Yeah, some people have observed that uh, economists always talk about base broadening and so on and, and keeping rates low. but politicians find it much easier to uh, simply raise the rate, raise the sales tax rate, or raise the income tax rate. And I think it's more of a political issue as opposed to an uh, economic issue. Now, if you raise the sales tax, you have uh, dry cleaners and photo, I guess there aren't photo processors anymore, but dry cleaners and health clubs and all kinds of people are going to go to, uh, to the state and, and start complaining. Well, if you raise the rate by a half a percent, it's kind of diffuse. You don't get the same kind of political response uh, in, in those situations. Well, that's all the time we have for questions, so um, I thank you very much to all of our presenters today. It's, it's been very informative, and Dr. Mooney, I'll, I'll let you talk about the next um, session that we have coming up. Yes, okay.
Thanks, uh, Amy, and thanks uh, for everybody for joining us today. Uh, the uh, next session will be, as it says here, August 12th, uh, same time, bring your lunch. Uh, and we will um, talk in that time, at that time about uh, various uh, spending uh, options. Uh, it's a little more ambiguous and amorphous when you talk about cutting spending. Uh, the, the, the fiscal, the revenue raising stuff is, is much more uh, is sharply defined. Uh, but we will tackle that issue in August. And we, we really appreciate you all joining us. We look forward to your feedback. Our May 13th uh, webinar is available online at extension.illinois.edu, L-G-I-E-N, also at the IGPA website at igpa.illinois.edu. You can also find the actual budget toolbox at IGPA's website, as some of the presenters mentioned. So we thank you again. You have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you on uh, the August uh, webinar. Um, that would be August 12th, but we look forward to seeing you then. Bye, everybody.